The safety is only with God. There's no safe place in Gaza. No place is safe in Gaza at all. <laughs> We can't feel anything right now. We don't care about life anymore. As thousands of Palestinians flee their homes to escape the fighting, Israeli forces have once again stormed the Al-Shifa hospital in Gaza, where thousands of people and dozens of newborns are currently taking shelter. I'm Valerie Castro in for Gadi Schwartz. It is 3 a.m. in Gaza, where there are reports that Israeli forces are currently maintaining position inside the hospital. The IDF says they're looking for, quote, well-hidden terrorist infrastructure in the complex and claim that a video they offered up shows some sort of operational tunnel. The images presented from inside the hospital could not be independently verified by NBC News. The Israeli military continues to claim there is a secret Hamas command center inside the hospital. White House officials have said they believe this as well, but there is still no concrete proof of its existence. Also new today, Israeli forces say they have identified the body of a hostage near Al-Shifa Hospital. Yudit Weiss was allegedly taken hostage by Hamas on October 7th. Meanwhile, officials in Gaza say internet and phone networks are collapsing due to a lack of fuel, which is also preventing sewage pumps and water plants from working. The United Nations says sewage is now flowing through the streets of Rafah, and there is a massive increase in diarrhea among those sheltering in UN schools. And as thousands of people evacuate the fighting in northern Gaza, we're seeing reports that Israel is now asking people to evacuate from four towns in southern Gaza as well, dispersing leaflets with warnings written in Arabic, raising fears that its war against Hamas could spread to areas it previously said were safe. NBC's Jay Gray joins us now from Tel Aviv. Jay, a doctor at Al-Shifa says Israeli forces raided the hospital for a second time. What exactly are they looking for, and are they any closer to finding it? Yeah, and Valerie, what they're looking for is a command center that both Israeli and U.S. intelligence say is located inside that hospital. Are they closer to finding it? It would appear uh, that they believe they are. They found some technical uh, supplies as well as paperwork that they think is leading them in that direction. We know that special forces are continuing to uh, scour areas in and around the Al-Shifa complex, and today they have found more weapons, more ammunition. Uh, they also found what they call an operational operational tunnel near the facility so their work is continuing and they are continuing to search for that command and control center and we've continued to see images of people being treated at those hospitals this hospital there are thousands of people yeah. hundreds of patients in this one in particular how are they being affected by these grades well, the doctors say they've been forced to relocate some of their most critical patients because of what's going on with the IDF teams on the ground there. They also say that many inside the hospital remain in constant fear about what could be coming next with the IDF soldiers inside and with so many tanks, so much heavy equipment outside. Given what's happening, is the hospital able to get any sort of aid? At this point, they really have not, Valerie, nothing of any substance anyway. And at least one of the doctors inside has said because of the lack of supplies, they are being forced to make what he says, quote, are harrowing decisions about patients. And finally, Jay, what can you tell us about the hostage that was found dead near the hospital? Yeah, Yudit Weiss, a 65-year-old mother and grandmother, she was found, her body, uh, near a facility adjacent to the hospital, one that the IDF says is used as a weapons cache. Uh, she was battling cancer before she was kidnapped, and, and her family says that they just finished the 30-day mourning period for her husband, who was killed on October 7th. All right, heartbreaking updates there. Jay Gray, thank you so much. We're following breaking news in Louisville, where a federal judge declared a mistrial in a civil rights case against a former police officer involved in a 2020 raid that left Breonna Taylor dead. Brett Hankinson was accused of using excessive force and violating Taylor's rights when he fired multiple shots into her home. But the jury deadlocked on both counts against him today. Hankinson is one of four people federally charged in connection to the raid. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster is following the latest developments on this. 
After about three days of deliberations, a mistrial has been declared in the case against Brett Hankinson, the former Louisville police officer who was involved in the raid that killed Breonna Taylor in March of 2020. A jury coming back to the judge saying essentially that they were deadlocked on the two federal civil rights counts that he was facing. Prosecutors allege that Hankinson essentially used excessive force during that overnight raid that led to her death. While he did not shoot Brianna Taylor, prosecutors say that he went to a window and sliding glass door that were covered by blinds and a curtain and blindly follow, fired into her apartment, uh, violating the civil rights of not just Taylor and her boyfriend who were in that apartment, but a family and a neighboring apartment where some of those bullets landed. Hankinson took the stand in this trial, saying that he had no choice, that he thought his fellow officers were being ambushed and that he was doing what he could to protect his life and the lives of his officers. He was already acquitted uh, for a similar trial in a state case, a state trial there um, more than a year ago. And now the federal government has a decision to make for this trial. The judge is setting a hearing for sometime next month to determine the next steps in this case. This is something it was clear throughout the day that the jury was truly struggling with this case. They asked the judge multiple questions as they deliberated. And at one point, according to a reporter who was in the courtroom, court officers, security officers were called because of elevated voices coming from that jury room. Again, the judge will set a new hearing uh, next month to determine the next steps in this case. Uh, the death of Breonna Taylor, obviously causing so much pain in the Louisville area and part of that social justice movement back in 2020 that led to so many calls for reform. Back to you. Okay, Shaq Brewster, thank you so much. Tonight, a suspect has been arrested following the death of a Jewish man in California. It happened after a confrontation during competing rallies for Israelis and Palestinians. Police say 50-year-old Lue al Naji is being charged with involuntary manslaughter in the death of 69-year-old Paul Kessler. al Naji is the man you see sitting on the cement wall near the gas station sign talking to police officers. Police claim Kessler got into an argument with a pro-Palestinian demonstrator at the rally outside Los Angeles earlier this month before falling in hitting his head. He died at the hospital the next day. The specifics of what led to the argument and how it went down are still under investigation. Liz Kreutz joins me now. So Liz, what do we know about the suspect and this arrest? Hey, Valerie. Yeah, so as you mentioned, police this morning arrested 50-year-old Lue al Naji, and they arrested him for involuntary manslaughter. He is currently being held in jail with $1 million bail. We know that he was part of a pro-Palestinian protest and that he is a college professor at the Ventura, college, uh, Ventura County Community College. The school put out a statement where they said, we are aware of the recent event uh, arrest of one of our employees, Lue al Naji, in connection with the investigation into the tragic death death of Paul Kessler and that effective immediately Mr. al Naji will be placed on administrative leave. Now previously police had said that they had identified a suspect, a 50 year old man who they say had stayed on the scene after Kessler fell and had called 911. According to the latest booking information from the Ventura County Sheriff's Department, it does seem like the next hearing with this suspect will be on Monday, Valerie. Okay, and police say they're hoping the public can help out with this ongoing investigation and what are they specifically asking for? Yeah, Valerie, they've been asking for more video, and I think that that just goes to show that this investigation is, is really still underway. Police had said that they were getting conflicting statements from witnesses, which was making it hard for them to move forward with this case. It's still unclear what new information police got that led them to be able to make an arrest now. We had heard from a state senator that perhaps Paul Kessler himself had been filming the incident on his cell phone, so we're waiting to hear if perhaps police were able to access that video on his phone. Now, again, Again, right now, uh, he was arrested, the suspect, for involuntary manslaughter charges. No reference to any hate crime. Whether or not that is still under investigation is also something we're going to continue to follow, Valerie. Okay. Liz Kreutz, thank you so much. We appreciate your time.
The conspiracy theorist who attacked Nancy Pelosi's husband inside their home has been convicted of attempted kidnapping and assault. David DePap was found guilty of one count of assault of an immediate family member of a U.S. official and one count of attempted kidnapping of a U.S. official. Nancy Pelosi's office released a statement in part praising her husband Paul for his extraordinary composure and courage on the night of the attack and in the courtroom this week. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson joins me now from San Francisco. So, Steve, the jury found David DePap guilty on all counts. What was the prosecution's reaction to the verdict? Yeah, Valerie, we uh, heard from the prosecution shortly after the verdict was read. I want to take you inside the courtroom, though, because this was a week-long testimony. It was eight hours of deliberation, and I would say all in about eight to ten minutes that verdict was read. Count one guilty, count two guilty. What I was looking for inside the court was any sign of anything on David Pap's face. He really hasn't shown any emotion this entire week, and we didn't get any from him really as that verdict was being read uh, as well. The prosecution obviously happy about this, uh, feel like they've done their job in not only putting away somebody that has violated a personal space, violated a person's home, violated a person's body to their uh, consent, but also really violated what it means to have a political opinion in this country. Uh, the U.S. attorney for the Northern District uh, said essentially you, you're allowed to have your political opinion, but that in no way should lead to violence, lead to attacking members of Congress. They really wanted to make that statement, uh, and I think they did with all the evidence, both physical and digital, that they had on David DePap leading to a conviction. And Valerie? Steve, what is next in this case? When will he be sentenced? Sentencing is next month, I believe, on the 11th. But remember, this is not the only case against a path. There's also a state case, which is expected to proceedings getting rolling at the end of this month. That one for attempted murder, for home invasion, for uh, elder abuse, more straightforward charges. Uh, and we expect to hear a little bit more in the next few weeks. Valerie. OK, Steve Patterson, thank you. It was another no good, very bad day for New York Congressman George Santos. And tomorrow, the House Ethics Committee will introduce a resolution to expel him from Congress. This comes after a scathing report that found the controversy-laden Republican, quote, violated federal criminal laws, among them using campaign funds to purchase designer clothes, Botox, and even content from OnlyFans. In a statement on social media, he called the report a, quote, disgusting politicized smear, but added he would not see seek re-election next year as a result on Capitol Hill. Reaction seemed pretty unanimous. George Santos is a fraud. He should not be a member of Congress. I'm from New York. My district um, is right next to Santos's district. Uh, my voters and I are quite aware of the fraud that he perpetuated. I don't need an ethics report to tell me what I already know. I'm hoping that George does the right thing and resigns and, and uh, leaves Congress. Um, the Thanksgiving break is a great time to do that. Okay, joining us now is NBC's Ryan Nobles. Ryan, so what exactly did this report find? Well, it was pretty shocking in many ways, Valerie. I mean, uh, we've been covering the allegations against George Santos now for almost a year, but uh, it was surprising how much new information this investigation was able to reveal. Uh, among the most uh, damning allegations was that Santos lied on his campaign finance report and that he used uh, money that was donated to his campaign from supporters for lavish things uh, like, for instance, uh, designer shopping sprees. He used it to pay for cosmetic uh, uh, cosmetic plans like uh, Botox. He also, uh, as you point out, uh, was using it for the website OnlyFans, which uh, generally is used for adult content. So these are all things that are violations of the campaign finance laws. They're violations uh, of the House rules. And as a result, we're now starting to see more and more of his colleagues saying that now is the time for him to be expelled. And the, the last vote to expel him from Congress actually failed. So what happens now? Yeah, and the reason behind uh, the, the fact that it didn't pass the last time around, at least the excuse that many members that didn't vote for the expulsion gave, was that they thought that Santos deserved a level of due process, that he had the opportunity to defend himself, and if for some reason these allegations weren't true, he was given the right to prove that. Well, in the case of this ethics report, uh, the members of the committee said that he didn't cooperate, didn't sit for a deposition, didn't try and rebut any of the hard evidence that they discovered. And so now you see many of these members that were concerned about due process now believe that he's been afforded that, and they're ready to move to that expulsion vote.
And Ryan, he's already been charged with multiple federal counts of identity theft and money laundering. Could this report impact the DOJ's investigation? It could because, in part, uh, the ethics uh, committee actually referred many of their findings, of which they felt were violations of the law, to the Department of Justice. So, uh, in addition to the fact that he already has a voluminous amount of charges against him in the federal indictments, uh, because the ethics committee was able to disco discover what they believe are uh, additional examples of breaking the law, that could mean he could face even more counts on top of what he is already dealing with in that indictment. So, there is the possibility of that, but the ethics committee was very clear that they did not want to interrupt that Department of Justice investigation. That's part of the reason that they pushed the report out right away without a specific recommendation, although it seemed pretty clear in their language that they believe that George Santos should no longer be a member of Congress, Valerie. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ryan Nobles, thank you so much. Don't go anywhere. We're just getting started. Sean Combs, a.k.a. Diddy, is being accused of rape by singer Cassie, who was on his label. We'll have those details. Plus, Starbucks workers walked off the job today, coinciding with Red Cup Day, where stores are already busier than usual. We'll take a look at what they were demanding. And for over a month now, families are desperately trying to get their loved ones home from Gaza who are being held hostage. Later this hour, you will hear their heartbreaking stories. Kidnapped is not the right word. It's so much worse than that. When our son is dancing at a music festival, has his arm blown off and is taken. Welcome back. Here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Music mogul Sean Diddy Combs is being accused of rape and abuse in a new lawsuit filed by singer Cassie. The R&B singer who was once signed to his label says that Combs physically abused her for over a decade. A lawyer for Combs rejected the accusations, calling them outrageous and offensive. Caitlin Armstrong has been found guilty of murdering professional cyclist Mariah Mo Wilson. A Texas jury deliberated for over two hours before convicting Armstrong, who now faces up to 99 years in prison. Armstrong shot Wilson three times last year after Wilson had dinner with Armstrong's on and off boyfriend. A Chicago commuter train collided with rail equipment this morning, hurting nearly 40 people. 23 people were taken to local hospitals and three are in critical condition, but none are life-threatening injuries. The National Transportation Safety Board is sending a team to investigate the cause. A Georgia high school football coach has been fired after he invited a pastor to baptize 20 of his players. The mass baptism took place after a practice last month. The coach will remain on staff as a teacher and the school district is still investigating. And Florida is dealing with the aftermath of heavy rains that submerged neighborhoods and left over 100,000 people without power. Miami-Dade County recorded nine plus inches of rainfall and some areas saw between 15 and 20 inches. The storm is now heading up north and is expected to hit the New England coast by Saturday. The president giving two speeches at APEC in San Francisco today. He focused on the global economy and the importance of keeping things friendly between the United States and China. Stable relationship between the world's two largest economies is not merely good for the two economies, but for the world. A stable relationship. It's good for everyone. The president also attended the summit alongside other world leaders, taking a family photo in what's become a tradition at the conference. NBC News' Jake Ward is back again with us tonight. Jake, Biden's speeches today. What were your takeaways and what was the goal for him attending the summit earlier today? Well, you know, the big takeaways I think here are just how much things have changed, Valerie, between China and the United States. This whole era that we were in, what China referred to as their wolf warrior diplomacy era, in which they were trying to really project a posture of real, not just strength, but aggression against the United States as China seeks to, you know, supplant the United States as the world's military, technological, and commercial leader. You know, that era has really softened up uh, if you're going to, you know, if you, if you take the signs coming out of this meeting. And it really is reflected in Biden uh, saying today uh, everything he did, both, you know, as you, as you uh, uh, showed us there a moment ago, uh, the idea that, that a good relationship between these two countries is a, is a good, I, you know, is just a sort of general good thing for the world. But he has also said uh, on stage today that the significant differences continue to exist between China and the United States. Uh, last night, uh, uh, after coming out of his hours-long meeting with Xi Jinping, 
He, of course, uh, you know, said a few critical things about, about Xi as well. Meanwhile, you did not hear the, the Chinese president really say that much critical about the United States. And that really, I think, reflects just how much China seeks to get out of the United States. They were looking at a time of tremendous economic disadvantage to try to, for instance, get these sanctions removed that were keeping uh, uh, the most high-tech chips out of the hands of Chinese companies. They're looking for better military connections to the United States so that they can at least have a, a line of communication there. Some, some big agreements were reached. And so I think a real shift seems to have taken place here in the relationship between the world's two big superpowers. And Jake, of course, there's also some fallout from the president's speech last night when he called President Xi a dictator when he was answering a reporter's question. Lester Holt asked Secretary of State Antony Blinken about that moment in a one-on-one -on -one earlier today. Let's watch. And Mr. Secretary, are you at all concerned the president's reference to President Xi as a dictator could undo any progress from yesterday's meeting? I guess the question is, how sensitive is this relationship at this stage? Lester, well, it's no surprise that, um, and I don't think it'll be a news to anyone, that we have very different, different systems. And uh, the president always speaks candidly, and he speaks for us. But what's important is what we were able to achieve with yesterday's meeting. Okay, so he may have been speaking candidly there, but how much damage did that actually do, Jake? Well, you know, if, if you were to look at Antony Blinken at the very moment that the president said that um, in his conversation uh, led by uh, questions from our own Peter Alexander, I mean, Antony Blinken's face just fell. You could just see him kind of twitch when the president in those off-the-cuff remarks referred to the president of China as a dictator. Um, but I have to say their fallout has been very limited today. We heard a little bit of official rumblings about that being wrong, but you did not hear in the end anything from President Xi himself. Uh, and here we have Anthony Blinken and uh, President Biden both continuing to say, well, this is how we think of uh, the, the, uh, the system of government in China. Very different. It is a, you know, a centrally controlled system, one that can wipe away industries with the snap of a finger and no public input. And so the fact that he spoke as candidly he did and used the D word, but did not seem to catch any uh, blowback from President Xi himself is a mark I think of just how much China seems to want out of the United States and how uh, much it, it wants to end this on a smooth note, Valerie. And Jake, there was also the moment from President Xi during a speech last night where he hinted at sending more pandas to the U.S. as a goodwill gesture. That's, that's a good sign, right? You know, it's a good sign. It is interesting. I would say that uh, uh, the idea was that he's going to send pandas back to the United States, but he's sending them to California, here to the fourth largest economy in the world, one that is, uh, you know, hugely connected to the economy of Japan, uh, excuse me, the economy of China. And so I found myself wondering the degree to which, and, I, and several people over the course of the day have also pointed out the degree to which, you know, perhaps that is an effort to cozy up to Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, and to the many, many CEOs who have been in attendance at this APEC, you know, uh, you know, if we know anything, we know that powerful people do not do anything for simply one reason. And so while this does seem to be a goodwill gesture, and God knows pandas are cute, they, seem, uh, they are undoubtedly part of the grander bargaining chip in the grander negotiation between these two countries. Okay, Jake Ward, thank you for your reporting on this. We appreciate you. For the last 20 years, China's been growing its influence somewhere where you may least expect it, Latin America. Now the Asian country is working on plans to develop a $3.6 billion port in Peru. NBC's Keir Simmons has that report. Tonight, thousands of miles from its own borders, China's growing presence in America's hemisphere is visible from this massive construction site. A $3.6 billion deep water megaport that China's President Xi hopes to open in Peru next year. Built by China's Costco shipping, it's an economic beachhead for Beijing in America's backyard. What we need is investment. Whether it comes from China what or it, what it wherever. Comes, what it comes according to the interest of Peru and the people of Peru. We were given extensive access. The signs in Spanish and Mandarin Costco Shipping, a company owned by China's communist government, has 60% of this huge project in a small town called Chiangkai. These docks will handle the world's biggest cargo ships, a million containers a year, they say, growing to five million in time. And a new route across the ocean, connecting South America and Asia from Chiangkai to Shanghai. Do you think America 
failed to see the opportunities here. I think there are many opportunities now. And Chinese companies may soon own Lima's entire electricity grid, as well as at least five mines. Not every Peruvian is benefiting. Last May, a street partially collapsed while digging a tunnel to access the Chinese port. And explosions from the construction have caused many houses to crack. It's near my house. Community leader Miriam Arce's artist studio is on the front line. Dust blankets every surface. It's hard to have a conversation because it's so noisy. Yeah, yeah. And some in the US worry what may come next. Could we one day see a ship from the People's Liberation Navy dock in this port? Well, this port is orientated to commercial activities. Not all here are so confident. We're squeezed between America and China, Miriam says. Uh, we are in the middle. A small South American fishing community soon to be caught up in the competition between two superpowers. Keir Simmons, NBC News, Chiang Peru. Coming up, a man in Mississippi was killed by police and then buried without his family's knowledge. We have those disturbing details. But first, you got to see this, or rather, you got to hear this. I guess, sir, uh, we are a cargo plane. Uh, we have live animal horse on board the airplane, and the horse managed to escape his stall. Uh, we don't have a, a problem as of flying-wise, but we need to return, return back to New York. We cannot get the horse back secure. A <laughs> horse on board. That's right. A horse got loose on a cargo plane from New York to Belgium mid-flight, but the pilot didn't horse around and was able to land the plane safely back at JFK, requesting a vet for the animal when they landed. I guess you can lead a horse to a plane, but you can't make it fly. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Here are some of the stories happening out west that we're following. The Bay Bridge has reopened after pro-Palestinian protesters shut it down during the height of rush hour today. Some were lying down with white sheets covering them that said, stop the genocide. Police say 50 people were arrested. Today's protest coincides with the APEC summit in San Francisco and comes a day after protests in response to that event. Snoop Dogg, who's known to smoke so much weed that he once hired a person to roll his blunts for him, says he's giving it up. Writing on Instagram today, quote, after much consideration and conversation with my family, I've decided to give up smoke. Please respect my privacy at this time. Representatives for Snoop could not be immediately reached for comment, so we don't know what kind of smoke he's quitting or even if he's serious. And the Oakland A's are moving to Las Vegas. Major League Baseball owners voted unanimously today to make it happen. A's owner John Fisher wanted this move ever since he failed to get government officials in Oakland to approve a new stadium in the city. But here's the thing. The lease at the A's current stadium is up at the end of the 2024 season. Their new stadium in Vegas won't be ready until 2027 at the earliest. So it remains unclear where the team will play next season. The last person believed to see a missing California woman in Guatemala is speaking out publicly for the first time. Nancy Ng was last seen paddling on a lake at a yoga retreat on October 19th. This video was obtained by her family and shared with NBC News. Now, after weeks of very little information, one of the other people on the lake that day is talking through her attorney. Her name is Christina Blazik. Her attorney says Blazik warned Ng that the current was strong on the lake that day. Then she saw Ng get into the water, and when Blazik turned around to help, Ng was gone. Ng's family claimed that Blazik ignored a number of emails and other attempts to speak directly with her. I'm hearing that we've done all we can do, or I did everything by the book. But why did it take, us, take her so long to, to now give a statement four weeks later through her attorney? That's something that I don't understand. The family has also hired a private search and rescue team to search the lake, but so far they have found nothing. New exclusive details tonight in the disturbing case of a Mississippi man run over by police and then buried without his family's knowledge. The lawyer for the family of Dexter Wade, who was hit by a Jackson police car back in March, says an independent autopsy found Wade had an ID with his home address on it at the time of the accident. Police originally failed to notify his family for months, instead burying him while Dexter's family was searching for him. NBC's Priscilla Thompson has more. 
Yeah, such a gut-wrenching situation for this family. And one of the biggest revelations that we're now getting from that independent autopsy is that Dexter Wade had a wallet in his pocket with a state ID that had his home address, the address that he shares with his mother. And so it would appear that police had access to that and could have potentially gone to that address in order to alert her to what had happened. The pathologist who conducted that autopsy says that in addition to finding that wallet. They also found a credit card and a health insurance card. And we're also learning new uh, revelations about the injuries that Dexter Wade suffered, uh, including the uh, attorney for the family, Ben Crump, saying that the body had not been embalmed. And as a result, they found an, an advanced state of decomposition when he was exhumed. And as this autopsy was conducted, they also found blunt force injury to his skull, ribs, and pelvis and also that uh, his leg had been amputated. So those are some of the new details that the family is now learning. And of course, this is raising even more questions about what exactly happened here. And of course, going back to why police were not able to alert Dexter Wade's uh, family. Now, officials say that they did attempt to call Wade's mother and that they weren't able to reach her, but she says that she never received a call and has no record of receiving a call. And now with this revelation that an ID card was found. It begs the question, why didn't anyone go to that address and attempt to notify this family? And I should point out, the city of Jackson has released a statement after we reached out to them saying, from the moment the coroner arrived on scene of the accident until the moment Dexter Wade was buried, his body was in the custody of Hines County and not the city of Jackson. The authority to examine, bury, and or exhume lies with Hines County and not the city of Jackson. So already we're beginning to see some some of this finger pointing. Now, we have also reached out to the county coroner. They have not responded to NBC's request for comment, but at this point, the family and their attorneys are asking for the Department of Justice to get involved and to conduct an investigation to figure out what exactly went wrong and hopefully be able to offer this family some accountability, though no word yet on whether or not the DOJ plans to pursue that investigation. Back to you. All right, that was Priscilla Thompson reporting. Today, thousands of Starbucks workers walked off the job. So we just have basically an infinite amount of drinks and we're understaffed and we're underpaid and we're sick of it. It's part of a long battle with the company over unionization. The one-day strike meant to protest what workers say is too much demand, especially on days with discounts and free stuff like the famous Red Cup Day. NBC's Noah Pransky has more on their demands and the company's response. The vibe from protesters all across the country is not that they were trying to change the Red Cup promotion, that they were trying to change Starbucks culture. They want better worker treatment. And you take a look at the numbers. This was the biggest walkout in the two plus years now of Starbucks organization from the workers trying to unionize. Now we know dozens and dozens of stores all across the country. Today alone, 5,000 workers walked off the job at 200 different locations. They were complaining of burnout, of fatigue, and a host of other things that they point directly to the Starbucks Corporation. We've been trying to negotiate with Starbucks, but they will do anything to like not meet with us, so they'll stall. Start bargaining with us, you know, listen out, listen to what we have to say, at least come to any kind of, you know, cooperative place for us to build up a contract. The big picture here, too, workers are filing complaints across the country about Starbucks, what they say refusal to come to the table and bargain with these new unions as they form over the last couple of years. At the local level, there are also complaints here in New York City that the corporation is not obliging with New York's Fair Work Week law, which provides workers at fast food organizations and Starbucks regular schedules. It guarantees them advance notice of changes to their schedules and provides them extra pay when there are changes to those regular schedules, as well as other worker protections. The workers point to the bottom line. They say Starbucks is benefiting from these big promotions like Red Cup Day, and not sharing it with workers. The bottom line for Starbucks in the last fiscal year, which just closed, $36 billion in revenue, up 12% from the year before. In New York City, I'm Noah Pransky, NBC News. Back to you guys. All right, tonight, tonight hundreds of innocent people are still being held hostage in Gaza, and their families really can't do much to get them home except hope and pray. Their stories are next, so stay tuned.
Welcome back. Let's take a quick look around the world. A heavily armed gang surrounded a hospital in Haiti's capital of Port-au-Prince yesterday. Health officials posted online for help, saying gangs were torching homes around the hospital, trapping people inside. Police eventually arrived using armored trucks to evacuate patients, including children and newborns. Gang violence across Haiti has increased since the 2021 assassination of the country's president. A Russian court sentenced an artist who openly protested the war in Ukraine to seven years in prison today. Sasha Skochelenko was charged with spreading false information about the military after she replaced supermarket price tags with anti-war messages last year. Her arrest came a month after Russia enacted a law criminalizing public expression against Russia's invasion of Ukraine. More than 200 conservative Muslims marched in Indonesia's capital yesterday, calling for a Coldplay concert to be canceled. The protesters are upset over the band's support for the LGBTQ plus community. The same group held rallies last week against the band, including outside the British embassy. And comedian John Oliver's worldwide campaign for his pick in New Zealand's Bird of the Century competition paid off. The bird, Putiki Tiki, is the official winner of the annual contest. Say that three times fast. We told you yesterday how Oliver's campaign delayed the vote count by a couple of days for thousands of votes to be counted. Oliver posted billboards all over the world to campaign for the Putiki Tiki to win. Israeli officials say about 240 hostages remain in Gaza, and at least nine Americans are believed to be among them. NBC's Lester Holt recently met with some of their families. Take a listen. My name is Ronan and Ornan Yutra. We're the parents of Omer Yutra, uh, born and raised on Long Island, and uh, was abducted in Gaza. My name is Yehuda Bainan. My daughter, Liat, and her husband, Aviv, were abducted from kibbutz near Oz on October 7th. They've been living a nightmare. My name is Hannah Siegel. My uncle, Keith Siegel, and his wife, Adrian, were abducted from Kibbutz Kfar Aza on October 7th. My name is Yael, and this is Roy Alexander. We're from Jersey. And my son, Idan, is 19 and is abducted to Aza. Their loved ones, all Americans, were taken by terrorists. My name is Jonathan Dekelchen. My son is Sagi Dekelchen, taken hostage by Hamas from Kibbutz near Oz on October 7th. My name is uh, Ruby Chen, uh, New York City, born and raised here with my son, Roi Chen. Uh, I am the father of Itai Chen, 19, abducted and kidnapped by Hamas. Not knowing how they are or when they might come home. My name is John Poland. My wife, Rachel Goldberg, our son, Hirsch, was taken from the music festival. There are 12 of you here, but you were speaking with one voice on behalf of those who have been taken. Can you tell me how important this is to be one voice, to speak loudly on this? I mean, I think it's very important as American citizens to say it's not okay for American citizens to be stolen, kidnapped, abducted, whatever word we use. I first met John and Rachel in their home in Israel. Their 23-year-old son, Hirsch, seen here hiding from Hamas. Witnesses say he was loaded into a pickup truck, his left arm missing. I feel like kidnapped is not the right word. It's so much worse than that. When our son is dancing at a music festival, has his arm blown off and is taken, all of us together our children, our loved ones, our American citizens who were wrongfully taken from where they were. Their kidnapped loved ones are neighbors, mothers and fathers, even a three-year-old girl. My name is Liz Hirschnoftali, and I am the grand aunt of Abigail Mori Don, and she's three years old, and she was abducted from Kibbutz Kfar Aza after her parents were both murdered. Three-year-old Abigail saw her mother killed then her father, too. Abigail was in her father's arms. And as they ran, a terrorist shot him and killed him. And he fell onto Abigail. Abigail's six and 10-year-old siblings somehow got away. They saw her hiding under their dad. And then... Abigail actually had crawled out from under her father's body. Mm. And full of his blood, went to a neighbor and they took her in. Later, Abigail and the neighbors were kidnapped. The last thing we learned was that somebody saw uh, the terrorist taking this mother, her three kids, and Abigail out of the kibbutz. 
And that's all we know. Yehuda, when you look around at this group, um, what do you feel? I think that what's driving all of us is a sense of hope. All of us have our own families, but now we have a new family. This is my new family. This new family now on a mission in Washington, including a meeting at the White House. Can you give us an idea of what was shared with you? Well, I, I can say this. Um, I think, speaking for all of us, uh, we're extraordinarily grateful to the, admin the Biden administration as a whole for taking what is clearly such a keen interest, not just in our own loved ones, but in all of the approximately 240 hostages that were taken that day. After all, as a, as a kid growing up in Connecticut, I grew up believing and then as an American Israeli living my entire adulthood in, in Israel in the Middle East, the United States being a kind of light on the hill um, for what's right, for what's freedom means and liberty means. At the end, talk is good. We want action. Yeah, you know, can I ask you to help us understand what it is like not to know? You live every day and thinking about it and you cannot eat, you cannot sleep. You just nonstop, like, I'm thinking about it, like, when I'm going to have some message. Let's say you have kids. I do. Yeah, I'm just You worried. know where they slept last night? We don't. Now think about that for a second. It's unimaginable. It's been 39 days. We know nothing. I know you've been championing the idea of really embracing the International Red Cross in this. What are they doing or maybe not doing that you think they should be? We just would like to know, first of all, are these people alive? And if they're alive, are they getting any sort of basic medical treatment? Let's do yeah. There's a huge amount of pressure on Israel to supply humanitarian support to the Gaza Strip. We understand. Where is the pressure to get our kids back home? Where is the pressure to get the Red Cross in? We don't feel that pressure. I would say also, Lester, that this dilemma, this impossible challenge that we all face, it speaks to the context of, of this situation. We're dealing with, unfortunately, a murderous, savage organization, Hamas. You're surrounded by some of the posters, of course, bearing the images of your loved ones, but we have seen people tear down these kinds of posters. I I'm just wondering what it's like to witness that. I don't understand it. I think if you listen to the stories like we've been listening now, how can you do that? It's very hard for us to understand what you're talking about, ripping down posters, but we're here to remind everyone that we are families. We are families who don't know anything about where our loved ones are. My family is a Holocaust survivor. And I'm unfortunate to say that the feeling is somewhat like Holocaust all over again. Settlements totally burned to the ground. People burned inside of their homes. That's Holocaust. Okay? And the disinformation that people are saying that this, this, this did not exist is exactly what happened in the Holocaust. No, we are the living proof that it did happen. These were people that were quietly living their lives. They were attacked. It's people that were living with heart and humanity, and it was just destroyed that day. I can only imagine you all look at what's happening in Gaza, the, the bombardment of Gaza through a different lens, because it's potentially putting your loved ones at risk. So it, can you help us understand what it's like for you to watch the war play out? Well, I will say that the day that the incursion started was one of the worst days because you felt like before at least we had our family in some place that might not be getting bombed. We don't know where anyone is, but for me personally and for our family, we, we worry every time something happens. Anytime there is a, an explosion or anytime there's some sort of fighting because we have no idea where our family is. You probably heard uh, this reporting of a potential deal in the works, uh, a swap of um, Israeli hostages for Palestinians who were being held. Does anyone take hope from that, that there is some movement? We're united in hope. We wake up every day hoping that this is going to be the day yep. that our families come home. And I have to ask you, I mean, it's, it's, it's not an easy question, but what gives you hope that your loved ones are alive? <laughs> There's no choice in the matter. The alternative is not that good. What's at stake here, 
I don't think is another Holocaust, but the victory of blind hatred over light. Nothing is perfect. Israel isn't perfect. We're not perfect. But there's an element of light here that must, must conquer this dark hatred and evil. That's true. And there's that's a the sense point. of urgency here. There's some sick people, injured people. Every day is precious. Every hour is precious. People will die. Americans will die. You, you also asked us about all about the, those political questions, about anti-Semitism, about this, uh, in, in general, about all, all, all the things that's happening in Israel. But I feel like it's important, important to say that we are the families. We are not generals. We are not tacticians. We, don't, we are not some political figures. We just want our loved ones back. Five, four, three, two. Our thanks to Lester Holt for that reporting. Before we go, it's time for the future of everything. We know there are a lot of areas of concern when it comes to AI, but what happens when you add politics to the mix? Next, we'll take a closer look at the AI-powered disinformation that could end up dividing our relationship with China even further. Stay tuned. how AI supercharges everything it touches. Well, ahead of the 2024, it's supercharging propaganda. NBC's Jake Ward took a look at the AI-powered disinformation that could prove to be incredibly divisive. As the U.S. and China meet in San Francisco this week, they are tied by trade but divided by politics. And China experts warn that a flood of AI-powered disinformation could divide them further. A generative AI is a dream come true for Chinese propagandists, it's cheaper, better, and faster, and can do so at scale to produce disinformation. China's ambitions to use AI for its political benefit are no secret. As early as 2019, Chinese President Xi Jinping urged his central committee to, quote, explore the application of artificial intelligence to guide public opinion. And the State Department says China is now spending billions on that goal. China Link's groups are already finding success on social media with evocative AI-generated images like this one, according to Microsoft. And Taiwan's digital minister, Audrey Tang, says she's seeing new AI-powered tactics firsthand as her country prepares for elections in January. It's now virtually no cost to tailor make that one message precisely tailored to you. And when everybody does that, it very quickly decimates the fabric of trust. And that is the main threat vector. The Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs has said China does not interfere in other nations' elections. Cutting and pasting, that's all I did here. How powerful is AI? Well, in just the 15 minutes we spent setting up our cameras, UC Berkeley deepfake expert Hani Rashid put together an AI-generated politician warning people not to go vote. It looked so much like a real politician, we've blurred its face. So even if you don't speak the language in question, you can still create a culturally and yep. linguistically yep. fluent piece of broadcast. 100%. So I can even tailor it specifically, not just English, but within a particular dialect or an accent. AI, by its nature, gets better at a task over time. And as it learns what messages move voters, it's about to become more and more convincing in any language. All right, Jake Ward, thanks so much. With races announced in Miami and Las Vegas, Formula One racing is enjoying a surge of popularity in the U.S. CNBC anchor Sarah Eisen shows us what it takes to drive in the fast lane. I'm probably one of the you know, last of a dying breed of kids coming from working class families. Today, seven-time Formula One champion Lewis Hamilton earns a reported $50 million a year driving for Mercedes. But he knows how tough it can be to break into racing when you come from a humble background like his. If I was to start again from where I started in a one-bedroom flat, you know, dad working four jobs, we still wouldn't get anywhere near close to the budget to be able to, to start go-karting. And that's just go-karts. It's a massively expensive sport. And money isn't the only potential barrier to F1. For women, it can be even tougher to make it in the traditionally male-dominated field. Susie Wolf was one of the few women ever to make it in the league when she scored a seat as a development driver in 2012. When I took to the track in the F1 car, it was a really special moment, but that's history now. And I'm 
Looking forward, she's hoping to launch the career of the next female F1 driver as head of a new women's racing league. So what is Formula One Academy? Formula One Academy is a race series only for female drivers, 15 young drivers with the best five junior teams. So what we want to do is accelerate talent and really make sure that we give the 15 young drivers the best chance of progressing in the sport. Abby Pulling has one of those coveted F1 Academy spots. She's 20 years old, but she's been racing since she was eight. You know, I'd be karting, take the helmet off, and they'd be like, oh, it's a girl, <laughs> it's like, like, like in the movies. <laughs> At a go-kart event in London, Pulling and other F1 Academy drivers are suiting up to inspire young girls who are just getting into racing through the karting pipeline. It's not me, it's the 10-year-old watching. If I'm not one to break, break the barrier into you know, Formula One itself, uh, you know, I, I hope that they will be. In front of a Texas audience, the F1 Academy drivers race to the finish of their first season. But their pursuit of an F1 seat is just beginning. Okay, CNBC anchor Sarah Eisen, thanks so much. That does it for us tonight. I'm Valerie Castro. We'll see you tomorrow, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.